be brain up there. We gather today to remember the life of our beloved servant of God who went home like a shooting star, and yet her presence remained with us. On this hot summer day in Memphis, Tennessee, these pilgrims have gathered to remember and honor Sister Thea Bowman. Good and gracious God, we thank you for the legacy of our beloved Thea, all that she taught us, and how she brought us in faith. We claim to remember her example. Who was Thea Bowman? What is the story of her life and her enduring legacy? She was a lightning rod. A preacher. A strong, charismatic woman. She loved everybody and she wanted everybody to treat each other like we are brothers and sisters. She was a profound cultural advocate. You would have found Sister Thea on the streets of Ferguson, in Minneapolis, in Baltimore, in Cincinnati. A fire burned in her. When she put her hand to the plow, she never looked back. Thea was definitely a prophet. Sometimes prophets are recognized as saints. Thea said that she was going to live until she died and that she was going to go home like a shooting star. Thea Bowman was a modern African-American Franciscan sister now under consideration for sainthood in the Catholic Church. She has joined the ranks of five other black Catholics awaiting sainthood. Pierre Toussaint, Henriette de Lille, Mother Mary Lang, Julia Greeley, and Augustus Tolton. Her canonization would be a source of great encouragement for black people to believe that the Catholic Church really does value us. It's an official recognition that persons of African descent can be and are models of holiness. It's a miracle what she did in her life. With the short life she had, that's a miracle enough for me to say she was saint. Bertha Bowman was born on December 29th, 1937, in Yazoo City, Mississippi, the only child of a respectable black middle-class family. Her father was a medical doctor and her mother a teacher. After their baby was born, the couple returned to Canton, Mississippi, where Dr. Bowman served the black community. Bertha's childhood was steeped in scriptures, music, and stories. She learned songs, songs of our people. Her grandparents, that generation, would have been part of the slavery era. And she saw their faith and their resiliency, their perseverance. She was not born Catholic. She was born in a black Christian tradition. Methodist, Episcopalian, Pentecostal. She enjoyed going to all of those churches because she enjoyed the preaching. And she enjoyed the singing and the uplifting music. Although the Bowmans were surrounded by the dire poverty of their sharecropper neighbors, they enjoyed a relatively affluent lifestyle. I grew up on Hill Street, just down the street from the Bowman home. Dolls, toys, anything that we had ever seen in the Sears Roebuck catalog, Bertha had it, and Mrs. Bowman always had cookies and milk. Mrs. Bowman was the epitome of grace and culture. A true Southern gentle woman, if ever there was one. When my little boy got killed, every day Miss Bowman would call me to want to know how I was doing and to say a, a Hail Mary. This went on for a, a good while. I mean, Sister Thea could not be anything but holy. The kind of mother she had, it had to come out. You might say it was in the DNA. <laughs> Although Catholic ministry was rare in Mississippi, 
the missionary servants of the Most Holy Trinity staffed Sacred Heart Parish in Canton. In the segregationist model of the times, however, the parish welcomed white Catholics only. One day, my cousin Charles Otto went to Sacred Heart Catholic Church to go to pray. He's very spiritual. And the white lady went and called the police. Police came and got him and took him to jail because he was in church. The Catholic Church was supposed to be universal. We was, thought we would be welcome, but we weren't welcome there. The priests at Sacred Heart Parish realized the pressing need for ministry to the black community. Decades of segregated life in Mississippi had created deep inequality in the education of black children. The priests invited the Franciscan Sisters of La Crosse, Wisconsin to establish a Catholic school for black children. In 1948, four Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration arrived to establish Holy Child Jesus Mission School. Bertha Bowman's life would never be the same. The white people at Sacred Heart Church wanted the nuns to come over there to teach their children and not teach the black children. System said, no, we came here to educate the children here. And they got mad with the nuns and called them all kinds of bad names. And Sister said, well, we'll just pray for them. When the Franciscan sisters first came, the black community were a little standoffish with them because here are these northern white nuns coming to their community and they really didn't trust them. We just didn't understand that a group of white women would come to the heart of racist segregationists in Mississippi to open up a school for black children. The sisters really earned their trust by making home visitations and they began to believe that these sisters really cared about their children. The sisters convinced mother and daddy that the tuition would be low, like $3 a month, and that we would get a good foundation, a good education. Thea's mother, being a teacher, wanted to make sure that she was well prepared when she entered school. And that's why she sent her to Holy Child Jesus Catholic School. Thea and I were among some of the first students to attend Holy Child and we just gravitated toward each other. The nuns were a part of my life. They made us feel like people. And in the white community, my mother was called girl. With the sisters, it was always Mrs. McClendon. And it was a good feeling. It was the first time for some of us that we were acknowledged as people, as being somebody. What drew Thea to Catholicism was the faith in action of the Franciscan sisters. She knew herself that if this is what Catholics are about, that's what she wanted to be. And she came to her parents at nine years old and said, I want to become Catholic. And they honored that. At the age of nine, Bertha Bowman was baptized a Catholic. Shortly after her baptism, she knew that she wanted to be a Catholic sister. And so she and her non-Catholic Pentecostal friend, Flanzi, would mimic the sisters. We decided that we were going to become nuns together. We would find ourselves at the convent, walking around, because that's what the sisters did in the evening after supper, with our little bandanas on, with our rosary. Now, I was only 11, and of course, when I announced to mother, guess what, Breath and I are going to become nuns. And of course, she said, but baby, I don't think your dad and I can allow you to do that. Thea wasn't drawn by the dogma of the church. She was not drawn by the liturgy of the church. She saw these white nuns pick up black children, clean their noses, kiss them, hold them. By the time she was 15, she knew what she wanted. And she wanted to be a servant. Bertha began telling her parents that she wanted to go to La Crosse, Wisconsin to become a sister. They were not pleased. Her mother and father wanted her to wait, go to high school in Canton, and so she was so upset about that, she refused to eat. She went on a hunger strike. Finally, her mother and father said, we will let you go to the convent. Her father said, why don't you join a convent in New Orleans where they have some black sisters and you would feel more at home? She said, no, I'm going to Wisconsin because I want to be with the sisters who taught me. She was drawn to those women who loved her, 
could have been Anchorage, Alaska. It wouldn't have mattered to her, and it didn't matter what color they were. Dr. Bowman said to the, uh, they're not going to like you up there. And she says, Daddy, I'm going to make them like me. And to the credit of the religious community, many who would not accept women of color, uh, they, they were open to her. Bertha boarded a train with Sister Lina and began the thousand-mile journey to the cross. Theo was supposed to sit in the baggage section, and Sister Lina would have none of that, so she got permission for Bertha Bowman at that time to ride in the passenger section. And that was a remarkable thing in 1953. Bertha arrived in La Crosse on August 21st, 1953. Her parents were right. There would be a long road of assimilation ahead for her as the only African-American member of this all-white, northern, predominantly German-Irish community. Theo was the first person I got to know as a black person. I had never met a black person before. When I first went to the convent, I thought if people didn't like me because I was black, I would accept that. I think any of the sisters who were negative simply did not have the experience of people other than Midwestern farmers for the most part, and Theo was uh, a novelty. One sister came up to me and said, we still like you even though you're black. I said, thank you. There were struggles for her, but I also know that the sisters were changed because she stretched them. She was a lovable person. So real and so wholesome and so genuine. She was so much fun. She had a great mind. I know it was way beyond anything I could put together. She had a magnetic personality, just a, a, a delight to be around. But much of Bertha's expansive personality, sense of humor, spontaneity and cultural expression would be repressed as she began her transformation into a proper Franciscan sister of the 1950s. I know about what she was going through, and a number of people of our generation had to share in the same tension and trauma of joining religious communities where we had to allow them to define us as valid or worthy. And for many black religious in the United States, we who enter predominantly white orders, we have to assimilate. We have to take our own self, our own culture, all of our background and upbringing and hold back. And very often you had to push aside uh, the things that came natural. You didn't walk in the room and say, you know, hey, how y'all doing today? You walked in the room and said, good evening, sister. What she tried to do was to model and imitate all of the other sisters. She was very, very meticulous in abiding by all the religious rules of the convent. I don't think Thea was ever a nice, white, FSPA sister. <laughs> I think she was always a black sister, always. But figuring out how that fit in time and space, wherever she was, was uh, generally the issue. Thea wrote me often. Not long after she got to La Crosse, she was diagnosed with tuberculosis and was in a sanitarium for a while. And she said, I am determined that I am going to be a Catholic sister no matter what it takes. And she was willing to go the distance Over the next several years, Bertha continued in her formation and training. She excelled at her studies. When she entered novitiate and received the habit and white veil, she was given the name Sister Thea in honor of her father, Theon. She began her elementary school teaching career at Blessed Sacrament School in La Crosse. In 1961, after only two years there, Sister Thea, 23 years old, received a surprise assignment, home to Canton, Mississippi, to teach at Holy Child Jesus School. Thea was delighted. She arrived ready to challenge, inspire, and support her students, first in elementary grades and later in high school. 
Sister Thea was a teacher that knew her students. She knew how to teach us. She wanted us to grow. She wanted us to be somebody. She would always tell us, you are somebody's child, you God's child. Sister Thea, gifted with an incredible voice and a love for the music of the black tradition, decided to form a school choir. Sister Thea decided that they were going to record an album called The Voice of Negro America. Everybody wanted us to come sing for them. We went to different colleges to sing. We had a great time. And we raised enough money to build a new wing onto the high school. Sister Thea was also a source of compassion and inspiration for her students. I was in the 11th grade. I was probably about five months pregnant. And I started to show. And then I got the number to call Sister Thea, and I told her. She was quiet, and then she said, are you okay? And I told her no. And she said, be strong, keep your head up. She always tell us, I want to see you all grow and do better and go out there and be somebody. She always knew I wanted to be a nurse. And she told me, do not let nothing stop me from fulfilling my dream. So I went to LPN school and Sister Thea made me a person. I'm glad to be who I am because of her. Thea would spend seven years in Mississippi 1961 to 1968, returning to La Crosse in the summers to take classes toward her bachelor's degree. In 1963, Sister Thea professed perpetual vows as a Franciscan Sister of Perpetual Adoration, and in 1965, graduated with a bachelor's degree in English. At that point, her community assigned her to do advanced studies in English in preparation for a future in higher education. Sister Thea went to the Catholic University of America to work both on her master's degree in English literature as well as her PhD in English. Thea came alive when she went to Washington, D.C. because that was the first time in her life she saw adult black people in positions of responsibility. They were professors, they were business people, they were bankers, they were lawyers. And that really raised her uh, awareness of who she could be. In 1972, armed with a newly minted Ph.D. in English, Sister Thea returned to Viterbo College and joined the teaching faculty. She was a master teacher and a very popular teacher, and she'd come bounding in singing. My Lord, what a morning when the stars begin to fall. And the put everybody class. in just the happy mood, and they were ready to learn. Let's begin. Theo was respected by everybody, and we were department chairs at the same time. And here's her size of voice at the table. That was well worth hearing. So this time when you sing the high note, can you think of a much smaller place? Daniel Johnson Wilmot, a voice teacher at Viterbo College, first met Sister Thea in 1972. They became professional colleagues as well as close friends. He always marveled at the strength, power, and tone of Sister Thea's voice. Thea had a world-class voice. She could have performed in art song or opera had that been something that she wanted to do. It was a powerful voice, projected naturally and very beautifully. She had a lovely range and vocal color. Eventually, we became very close and she started calling me her little brother. <laughs> so I referred to myself as being the white sheep of the family, you see. She told me one time that some of the nuns were getting a little bit gossipy about the fact that she was sitting out in the car with this young, young gentleman. 
And sometimes she said, no, let's just sit here a little bit longer. It'll give them a little more ammunition. So <laughs> there was never anything to it. And uh, I guess we were both flattered that people thought there might be. <laughs> if there was anything that everybody knew about Sister Thea, it was that she was Sister Thea. Thea was not the person who had the boyfriend or the girlfriend on the side. Thea was the person who had the Lord before her, and it was enough for her. Matthew, let's talk about the story. And As Thea taught in La Crosse, the civil rights movement was raging across the South. One hotspot was her hometown of Canton, Mississippi. There was so much racial turmoil going on, lynchings, sit-ins and encounters. There were people fighting in the streets. That perplexed Thea. There she was, over a thousand miles away. Even though she was away, she understood very well because we were on the news all the time with the marches. But now she never marched with us or was on a picket line with us. I think she felt some pain in that she really wanted to be so much with us. She knew that somehow God was calling her to be a voice and a witness to justice for her people. The tension was real for Thea, stationed so far away from the struggle. However, her vocational commitment remained firm. Now, I often would say to Thea, you know, do you, you, you think we ought to leave the convent? You know, we probably could do whatever we want to do and be as successful at it. And she would have none of that. She said, no, I've made my vows to the Lord and I never will turn back. She felt that she had a talk with God and God had her back. Something finally did compel Thea to return to the South, the declining health of her parents. In 1978, with her community's blessing, she left the Turbo College and returned to Canton to care for them. She also started a new job created by Bishop Joseph Brunini of the Diocese of Jackson, Mississippi. Bishop Brunini asked her to open up the very first office of intercultural awareness in the diocese. <laughs> you think they can't dance because you've never joined the rhythm of their lives. She used her special gifts, her art of persuasion, but certainly her voice in song. Thea knew how to bring people together. The bishop asked Thea to work across the diocese, speaking in parishes, conducting workshops, and raising awareness of the need for interracial and cultural respect. Her travel schedule took off. Sister Thea needed someone to help her with her parents. She asked me if I would come help take care of them. And I told her I would. I did it for about, I think, two years. In 1983, Thea celebrated her 25th jubilee of religious profession at the Mother House in La Crosse, Wisconsin. For this solemn occasion, she wore the usual black habit. A few weeks later, she celebrated her jubilee again in Mississippi. It was a transformative moment in terms of Thea's clothing. She had written me to let me know she was coming to visit us. When Thea opened the door, I see this tall, statuesque woman standing with a dashiki, some sandals, and an afro. I did a double take. I said, Bertha, what happened to you? What happened? She said, girl, them petticoats were just too hot. She did not have to wear a religious habit that came out of medieval Europe to say, I am a religious woman. Where is your habit? <laughs> My congregation has a simple sentence in guidelines that says that the dress of the Franciscan Sisters of a Perpetual Adoration shall be simple, modest, and appropriate, that the sisters wear the medal of the Blessed Sacrament in the ring. So this is it. <laughs> People gave her the African gowns. She didn't go out and buy much of anything. <laughs> Many things were given to her. Sometimes it was, uh, it was this dress from Nigeria, or that one from Senegal, or that one from Ghana. It was just transformational. 
While Thea continued to live with her parents in her family home, she kept in close touch with the sisters living nearby in the convent at Holy Child Jesus School. Sister Thea would call the convent and say to whoever answered the phone, I'm going to Clarksdale tomorrow. Does anybody want to go with me? And that's how I started to really travel with her and drive her. She started preparing her speeches in the car. We talk about the spirit that is God, the spirit that is transcendent. I think in her mind, she already had the speech done, but to put it on paper so the dashboard of the car, the seat around her, her lap would be full of pieces of paper. I still wonder how she did it. Whenever she went to give a talk, Thea did not just give a stoic lecture. She made participants of all of her audience and engaging them in song and in storytelling and in dance and in expression. She loved the arts. She was the intersection of black religion and the arts. I told Jesus it would be all right. We fell in love the minute we met, and she said, I like what you do. I wouldn't mind if you accompany me. To accompany Sister Thea, you had to be the energizer bunny like her. Ten for the ten car, man, man, to nine for the nine, I'll dress so fine. She said, just follow me. When I start, you start. <laughs> Because sometimes I wouldn't even know her key. Most of the time, she really didn't need a microphone. And then she could hit those high notes. Nineteen eighty four proved to be a devastating year for Thea. As her parents declined, she discovered a lump in her breast and was diagnosed with cancer. And I said, Thea, what can I do? Is there anything I can do? She said, yes, move in with me and help me with my parents. So I moved in to Hill Street. In that same year, Thea's mother and father both passed away within months of each other. Thea had begun radiation and chemo treatments, but she did not allow the cancer to slow her down. One thing I have asked of the Lord in my illness, I want to live until I die. I want to live fully. I want to love. I want to laugh. I want to help somebody. It just showed a level of acceptance that Thea had. I'm going to keep on going. When Bishop Bernini hired Thea, he thought that he was going to have Thea to himself. But little did he realize that she was renowned throughout the whole United States. She was in demand to give workshops and, and revivals and, and speaking at educational conferences. She had over 200 appearances in one year. In addition to her diocesan and national work, Thea also recorded an album of spirituals, collaborated on creating a hymnal for black Catholic liturgical music, and taught summer classes for those doing ministry among black Catholics. The Institute for Black Catholic Studies was founded in 1980 at Xavier University of Louisiana in New Orleans. Sister Thea came in 1982 to teach she was the first female black teacher that I had a PhD. She brought the best out of you, whether you wanted it or not. <laughs> I know I didn't have that kind of push in the seminary. If you don't get our attention from the get-go, you've lost us. Thea's God. preaching classes God. in particular God. upended God. typical God. Catholic seminary training. God. Thea, an unordained black woman, taught priests, both white and black, how to improve their preaching. Made my vow to the Lord. 
she awakened within me a sense of what it meant to preach the word as a black person. Remember last Sunday's gospel? Those that were at church last Sunday. <laughs> Jesus, his neighborhood rejected him. I don't think Thea was interested in wanting to be an ordained priest. I think she wanted to be respected as a religious leader, but she stayed in her lane. I'm called to teach. I'm called to worship and praise. I'm not called to go in church and sit there like a lump on a log. She knew that there was an official rule in the church that said that women can't preach. And so she would say, I don't preach. There are avenues for me to proclaim the word regardless of institutional structures. You don't have to call it preaching. If that gets in the way, don't call it preaching. Do what you can do as opposed to being angry. Don't stop. Don't say, I am nobody because they don't recognize me. As the scripture says, shake the dust off your feet and move on. <laughs> that we run into with black Catholics is some of us have been taught that black expression is not Catholic. Sister Thea was not completely comfortable with the church's position on every issue. I got the distinct impression that she was uh, somewhat uh, dissatisfied and she wanted to see more action. But she integrated her desire for change with a sense of tolerance and creativity. We have to study and to learn so that we are free to make choices from our own experience that are clearly in keeping with the mind of the church. Sister Thea never criticized the church. She loved the church. She didn't like the racism in society or in the church, and she spoke up against that. Thea challenged the church to the truth about justice and equality. Do the people in your parishes realize that if the black child does not have an, a decent education, they will pay for it? They will pay for it in welfare, they will pay for it in jail, they will pay for it in child support. We have all these issues floating around. And so often we seem to be afraid to attempt in Jesus' name to deal with them. She also understood that the church is made up of people and people are not perfect. She would often say, let me tell you the true truth. And whenever she said the true truth, you know you want to get a piece of her mind, but always done in a loving and constructive fashion. Thea understood that people have gifts, that genders don't have gifts, people have gifts. So whether it's a male or female, whether it is Catholic or Protestant, that we complement each other and that each of us has a role to play. She was giving the commencement address at the first graduation of the Institute for Black Catholic Studies. She spoke words of freedom and liberation to me. You can be your beautiful black Catholic self, that you have gifts to share and you must bring them as gift to the church. I thought about all of the assimilation I had to do to be a black priest. And I remember throughout her talk, tears ran down my face. Now you hear about Europe all the time, don't you? In your geography, in your history, in world affairs. Africa is five times the size of Europe. In 1985, Thea experienced the fulfillment of a lifelong dream. After her parents died, her friends across the nation organized a fundraiser to send her to Africa. The black Catholic clergy people and black sisters got funds for her to go to Kenya for the International Eucharistic Congress. We both went to Africa together and it was like we were home. That was a remarkable experience for her because she didn't, quote, stand out as being the only black person in a huge white population. She also went to Nigeria, and Thea didn't know for sure where her father's uh, relations were from, but she always thought she was from Nigeria. In 1988, 
the Mary Knowles sisters asked her to do a workshop on racism with her sisters in Kenya and Tanzania. And it was wonderful to have her back to Africa for the second time. She was confined to a wheelchair and she said, you know, I can't travel by myself anymore. I need a companion, I need somebody to assist me. So that's how I got to literally push her wheelchair around the United States and into Kenya and Tanzania also. But it, the trip really wore her out. She looked really sick and she was very, very weak, but she came alive. She was so happy to be in Africa. It was her homeland, I think, in many ways. Over the next several years, Thea's weakening health her geographical distance from La Crosse, her rising national profile, and her independence created some tension between herself and her community. She was a lightning rod, a strong, black, charismatic woman. I'm not absolutely sure that all the Franciscan sisters loved her because she was so popular. She could be abrasive. Now, you know, I wouldn't treat you like this if you were all adults. And her strength was threatening to some. In order to be faithful to her calling, she had to push it. She had to be independent. Amen! She spoke what she believed to be the truth, and she spoke it loudly. We need to teach our children how to get high on home on family. At the same time that women, and black women in particular, in our society are condemned for being strong and for being loud. She lived with all of that, but she loved her vocation. She never, ever, ever complained to me about any of the members of the community being negative to her. Most of us really felt that uh, her work was pivotal. I think the eyes felt very connected with us, even though she was in Jackson and Canton and on the road or in the air a lot. She was a strong, committed Franciscan sister. I think the journey was about, I may not pass this way again, so I have to say what I have to say and do what I have to do and be who I'm called to be while I had time right here. As Thea's national profile rose, interest in her life and message attracted attention from media personalities. She appeared on the CBS program, 60 Minutes. Mike Wallace met his match when he met Thea Bowman. Sister Thea said that when I teach children, I want them to know that black is beautiful. And she says, I take them and I say, take your finger and point to yourself and say, black is beautiful. She says, I wonder if Mike Wallace can say black is beautiful. And Mike Wallace tried to avoid that question. And she says, I still didn't hear Mike Wallace say black is beautiful though. Black is beautiful. Amen. Millions of people saw the segment, it was so popular that phones rang off the hook at the CBS headquarters and Mr. Harry Belafonte saw the segment and he knew that he wanted to do a biopic on her life. And so he began negotiation with Sister Thea and her community in order to have her life put on the big screen. And he had decided that Whoopi Goldberg would be a perfect Thea Bowman. Thea did go out to California, you know. Whoopi met Thea at her hotel to drive her over to Harry Belafonte's house, and there was this orange car out at the curb, and Thea said, what an ugly car. And Whoopi said, well, it's a Porsche. And Thea said, what an ugly car. <laughs> and they drove off in that Porsche. The movie was never made because in their estimation, Thea's life was not tantalizing or sensational enough. Thea's life was lived for the Lord. And if that wasn't enough to sell movie tickets, well, it was their loss. Sister Thea, weak from her cancer, presented the most significant address of her life in June 1989 to a gathering of all the bishops of the United States at Seton Hall University. Without further ado, we welcome and we are very joyful to have Sister Thea Bowman. I think it was within a year, year and a half of her death. 
and you could see it in her face. It's almost like she put the pain aside on her wheelchair and said, I'm gonna do what God is telling me to do. So Sathya was asked to address the bishops on what it meant to be black and Catholic. I was there, I was a member of the Conference of Bishops. She was very comfortable with the bishop. If there was any person in that room that was not intimidated, it was the opponent. What does it mean to be black in the church and society? I want to tell you about the church. Sometimes I feel she began singing, Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. She was trying to get the bishops to understand that as a child of the church, as a child of God, I feel motherless, I feel neglected. She reminded the bishops, there aren't too many in this room that look like me, and that our church is bigger than who we might see at, at times. She said that whenever you have a meeting, look around and see who's not sitting at the table, and then send somebody out to get them and bring them in. Then and only then can we truly be church. What does it mean to be black and Catholic? It means that I come She to said, my I come before you as a fully functioning individual with all of my history, my black culture, my black experience, my black music. And then she asked them the question. That doesn't frighten you, does it? I come to my church fully functioning. Now she asked it because she knew deep down that for many in that room, it did. We love our bitches, y'all. We love y'all too. But see, these bishops are our own. As she turned and looked at the black bishops, she said, these are our bishops. You may have ordained them as bishops, but they're ours. We raised them. They came from our community. And in a unique way, they can speak for us and to us. She eventually had the bishops join her in song. We shall overcome. Y'all get up. Now, bishop, I'm going to ask y'all to do something. Cross your right hand over your left hand. You got to move together to do that. <laughs> There wasn't one bishop that refused to stand or did not sing. I like to think that that was probably her first miracle. Well, there's reason to believe that. <laughs> to get the American bishops singing in unison, she loosened us up. And that's a big task for the American Episcopacy. <laughs> That was a critical and a pivotal moment for her. It raised to a, a level of finality her contribution to the church in the United States. It would be a sign of her spiritual authority. At the end, they presented her with some beautiful roses. In the name of all the mothers and grandmothers and aunts, all the women who have brought you to priesthood, who have nurtured you toward episcopacy, who have strengthened you in faith and hope and love so that you can be Church of Jesus Christ. I accept these beautiful roses. God bless you always. Sister Thea did a couple trips after speaking at Seton Hall. She became gradually more weak and more in pain. And it really hurt her that she had to cancel some of her appointments. That told me that she was really, really declining. As friends and colleagues recognized Thea's impending death, many made a pilgrimage to Canton to say goodbye to her, still living in the Bowman family house on Hill Street a steady stream of visitors and always so welcoming to her, whoever came. Thea had reached a point where she could not teach. She was homebound. 
And so the Institute decided on for our July 4th weekend, we would all go to her in Canton. She came from her bed to the church to meet the, the students. She looked very, very frail and affected. You want to see the hickey marks? Uh, with a figure on her neck where they would put the radiation. I'm showing them all. X marks the spine. As I look at the face, I just see so many people that I love, and I see so many people to whom I've been dead. And I, 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 all I want to say is thank you. And she started singing. With tears all over that building because she was giving us her farewell blessing. The last time I think we, we actually saw her alive. I just want to say goodbye. It's been good to know you. When I was visiting Thea, I said, Thea, is there anything you want that I can bring you tomorrow? And Thea said, oh, I would love a chocolate shake but don't let Dorothy know because I'm not supposed to have it. And so I never did tell Dorothy, but I brought the milkshake. I said, Thea, obviously you're gonna get to heaven before I do, so save a seat for me. She said, I ain't gonna save no seat for you. <laughs> she said, you didn't, need, you didn't need no seat down here. I don't know why you're gonna need one up there. <laughs> I said, you're not supposed to make jokes when you're dying. She said, I didn't know that. I, w I never died before. I had made arrangements with Dort to possibly have the choir come to the house and maybe sing something or say hello to Thea. And we came and that brought the whole choir into her house. There were 45 uh, students. And uh, we, I decided to sing uh, Roll Jordan Roll. And Roll Jordan Roll, I want to go to heaven when I die to hear Jordan Roll. When we were done, uh, Thea burst into tears. That's the only time I ever heard her cry because she couldn't sing herself anymore because Dort told me it was really, really bothering her that she had, didn't have enough breath to sing. Two weeks before she died, I went to visit Thea. She was coming out of the bathroom, walking very, very slowly, and I was almost in tears. And I said to her, I said, Thea, I wish that I could take your pain away for just one day. And she stopped and she said, Flonzie, you don't want no part of this. And a tear ran down both of our faces. And I hugged her because I, I didn't think that I would see her alive again. I'll never forget the last uh, phone call that I had from her. She wanted to talk to me and she got on the phone and she couldn't, I, there was just this uh, kind of mumbling in the phone. And of course I uh, really broke down that moment because I knew I knew that would be it for her and for me not being able to see her again on Friday March 30th Thea's Franciscan sisters and friend sister Addie Walker held vigil I woke up and I saw Sister Celesta lighting a candle. She said, I think the end is coming. I asked if I could have a minute with her. I sat on her bed, put my hand over her shoulders and said, Thea, it's all right to go. It's all right. I'll miss you. 
and your parents are waiting for you in heaven. And I said, goodbye, I love you. And she died. A memorial service was held at Holy Child Jesus Church in Canton. Completely filled chapel. People stood up and gave reflections on Thea's life. There waits for me a glad tomorrow. The funeral was at a big church in Jackson called St. Mary's. It was just a giant, giant crowd. And I think everybody felt Thea's spirit. This veil of sorrow. Before she died, Sister Thea gave me a brown envelope with all of her funeral plans, everything. And I was like, oh, Sister Thea, I got, no, I want you to do it. Everything was lined up, all the songs, everything she wanted. It was the papa's casket with blue felt covering. She said, I don't want all this money to put on me in the ground because we could take this seven or $8,000 and educate black children. Just put me in the cheapest thing they can find. While saints are singing, People were, were singing and praising the Lord just like she wanted it. She didn't want no sad celebration, you know, but it was beautiful. Someday God only knows just where and when. She said, when I'm gone, I want you to sing the song Zion's Hill. That was her dream, that when she was gone, she would be with her parents, her loved ones, on Zion's Hill. I shall go to dwell on Zion's hill. He is buried at the family cemetery plot in Memphis. Father John Ford, in his homily, said that Thea said that she was going to live until she died and that she was going to go home like a shooting star. So during the truth says, I'm not going to die, honey. I'm going home like a shooting star. And I shall go to dwell on Zion's hill. I remember looking down at Sister Thea in her coffin and saying, who's going to lead? Who's going to speak? Who's going to preach? Who's going to tell the story? And in her own special way, I heard in my spirit, you have to. You and countless others. Sister Thea died long before the Black Lives Matter movement began, but her influence is clearly felt. I think if Thea were alive, she'd say, I'm one of the mothers of Black Lives Matter. She would say, the slogan is new. The reality has always been there. She would be righteously angry, for sure. I'm not saying she would be out there leading marches, but I don't see how Thea could have sat quiet, quietly behind the scenes. The riots and things on, on television, I, I can't see Thea being involved in a riot. Violence was never in her vocabulary. She would have been calming people down. And... She'd probably get the microphone and sing a song because her gift was to take the oldest sounds of black liberation and invest those sounds in the generation in front of her. It's the wrong question to ask ourselves, what would Sister Thea be doing? We need to add, look and say, what is she doing? Through those who were blessed to have her as a teacher. She said, I'm a Franciscan sister. I want to be an instrument of peace. I want to be an instrument of hope. I want to be an instrument of faith and joy. Father David Jones, who's from Chicago, said Thea was there to speak, and she threw her coat to him and said, here, hold this. People here think I'm going to be a saint. They're stealing everything from me. <laughs>
Sister Thea Bowman's cause for canonization as a saint in the Catholic Church is underway, although it may take years to be accomplished. It is the Diocese of Jackson that's taking the lead in Thea's canonization process, and we're supporting them 100%. In November 2018, at the Plenary Assembly of Bishops, I introduced her cause, and by voice acclamation, she was on the path formally as servant of God. Is Sister Thea Bowman a saint? If Thea was sitting here, I would think she would just laugh if she was asked that question. A saint is not something that belongs to the 12th century. It belongs to us right now. She's been canonized in my heart since the day she died. She's the perfect person to be named a saint for us. We'll raise the roof up in celebration, absolutely celebrating Saint Thea Bowman. I say what I want on my tombstone is, she tried. Oh,